How many people in this room consider themselves to be innovators? Come on. Let's see it. Let's see it. Okay, okay, okay. How many of you have never failed? You're not innovators. No. Uh, you cannot be a successful innovator without failing. Uh, and if you have failed once, you'll probably fail again, which is why you'll continue to be successful here. Um, nobody has more, a more eloquent treatise on that than Ralph Kais, our next speaker. His book, Whoever Makes the Most Mistakes Win, is a brilliant read and should be on the sh shelf of anyone who claims to be an innovator. Uh, Ralph has authored 12 books, including a bestseller, the title of which is Is There Life After High School? It was also made into a Broadway play, uh, he, uh, a musical, and Ralph is also a fellow at the Western Behavioral Sciences Institute, and he has appeared on Oprah 2020 and on All Things Considered and, and NPR. Ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Kais. <laughs> one of the great openings of a popular song in American history. <clears throat> it's also the product of a great mistake. John Lennon had leaned his electric guitar against a, a big loudspeaker, and he got this terrible feedback and reverb. You, you want to hit it again, Brian? Ah, and they went, yeah, terrible, turn it off. And then Paul said, no, wait, turn it on again. Can you do that again? And out of that mistake came this incredibly great opening to I Feel Fine. Maybe you remember it. The Beatles' career was full of bloopers, but they tried to make a point of integrating them into their creative process. I don't know how creative I am, but I do know about bloopers. My career's full of them. Like the time when I was researching risk taking, and I went to interview a woman named Betty, <clears throat> Betty Rollin in New York City. Anybody remember her? She was an NBC News reporter, fine woman. And we had a really nice meeting. Before leaving, I inscribed her a copy of one of my books as a courtesy. I went home to Philadelphia, where I lived at the time. Then a couple hours later, the phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was Betty's voice. And she said, Ralph? I said, yeah. She said, this is Betty Rowland in New York. I said, oh, hi, Betty. What can I do for you? She said, well, I don't usually ask interviewers to do this, but would you read my quotes back to me for accuracy? And I said, um, Betty, I don't usually do that. Why do you ask? She said, well, you know that book you inscribed to me? I said, yes. She said, you inscribed it to Barbara. <laughs> and I went, oh, OK. Yes, I will read your quotes back to you. <laughs> Bloopers, mistakes, success, failure. not always easy to tell apart. You know, we think we can cleave them cleanly. Here's success, here's failure. But our failures sometimes lead to our successes. Our successes sometimes lead to our failures. The two are intermingled. One is the warp, one is the woof of any career. Think about your own. You know, can you say clearly, I know where I succeeded, I know where I failed, and the two never intermingled? Very few of us can. It's not even clear that failure is such a bad thing. It has a terrible ring. Failure, ooh. Mistakes, it's like cooties. Since we're being five. But 
I find that people who are really innovative, really creative, have a great respect for failure, almost a veneration. Just before coming here, I was reading a report by a Japanese researcher who was studying the relationship of creativity and failure. And he made a very interesting comment. His comment was, creativity is 99.7% failure. Walt Disney once said that everyone should experience one great failure, at least in their career. And he certainly knew what he was talking about. Anybody recognize this critter? That's Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. This was Walt Disney's first attempt at an animated cartoon character. Terrible fiasco, went absolutely nowhere. And because he had this terrible fiasco, he ended up with Mickey the Mouse. Yay, exactly. Yay. Now, what, had what would have happened if he had had a modest success with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? You know, suppose he had lucked out with Oswald. Would he have ever got to Mickey? Doubtful. And he knew that. And that's why he said everyone should enjoy at least one great failure in their career. He wasn't the only one. The first car that Henry Ford ever made, he forgot to put in a reverse gear. <laughs> I see we have people here from Sony, is that right? Is that great? Good. Akio Morita, did I pronounce that right? He started out to make rice cookers, as I'm sure you know, except they burned the rice. Thank God. Because having burned the rice, Akio Morita turned to tape recorders and radios and founded the Sony Corporation. Now, OK, you say small potatoes, rice cookers, no reverse gear. You're not talking Edsel, are you? You're not talking new Coke. Well, Roberto Guizueta, who was the CEO of Coca-Cola at the time of New Coke and was a great advocate for the new flavor, often said that it took a fiasco of that magnitude to make him realize that what Coke was selling was not flavor, but brand. <clears throat> Since we're here at Bramworks University, that seems like an appropriate thing to reflect on. Guizueta said, without a failure that big, he's not sure he ever could have reached the conclusion that bran was what Coca-Cola was selling, not flavor. And of course, he then went on to sell it with a vengeance. In my experience, the highest achievers are remarkably blasé about failure. It's just, it's just not something that concerns them that much. They're frying much bigger fish. Let me read you a quotation from a basketball player. This player said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Anyone care to guess who said that? Exactly. Michael Jordan. What's interesting to me is look at, look at the, how much track he kept of his failure stats. 9,000 missed shots, 300 lost games, 26 times he couldn't hit the winning shot. He kept track. But that's not necessarily uncharacteristic, in my experience, of very high-achieving, innovative people like Michael Jordan. In fact, I find there's almost a cult of failure among these folks. I don't know if you've ever been around two entrepreneurs talking, but the conversation often tends to, you think you've failed? Let me tell you how many times I've failed. They love it. They love to talk about their failures. You know, the color comes to their cheeks. Their voice, their voice takes on vibrance. What they hate talking about is their successes. Boring. 
Wilbur Wright once had dinner with Vannevar Bush, the great computer scientist, in the 1940s at Wright's home in Dayton. What did they start talking about? Their failures. And then Wright took Bush home to his house in Dayton, took him up in the attic, and he showed him a museum of weird gadgets, all of which were inventions of his, none of which had succeeded. And he was thrilled to show them off. And then Vannevar Bush told Wilbur Wright about the many times he had tried to come up with something new and hadn't succeeded. And Bush later said, we had a, it was a wonderful evening. We had a great time sharing notes on our failures. In my experience, innovators are not afraid to fail. In fact, Warren Bennis, the, the management guru, once said that what distinguishes innovative managers from in-innovative, since we're creating new words, in-innovative managers, was the fact that the innovative ones looked for opportunities where they might fail, while the more cautious ones avoided such opportunities and therefore were not innovative. Henry Ford called failure the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. And then there's Thomas Watson Sr., the great president of IBM, who once said the fastest way to succeed is to double your failure rate. If anything, in my experience, innovative managers fear success more than failure. You know, any coach will tell you that it's much, much easier to get to the top than it is to stay at the top once you've got there. Look at post-Watson IBM, look at Xerox, look at Kodak. I mean, these were companies focused on mainframe computers, on analog copiers, on film photography, long after the template had begun shifting beneath their feet. But because they were enjoying so much success with these products, they couldn't possibly make the moves they needed to make to prepare themselves for the era to come and almost went under in every case as a result. Success is the smother of invention. <laughs> anybody remember Railway Express? Anybody, I mean, uh, anybody my age here? I guess that's what I'm asking. When I went to college, that was how you sent your bags, I, my steamer trunk, Railway Express. You can't, I don't know if you can read it, but that's what this sign here says. But they kind of got stuck in the mud. There is no reason in the world that Railway Express could not be Federal Express. No reason, except they were too successful shipping freight by rail. Long after rail had begun to decline. Now, if they had thought ahead, hadn't seen themselves as successful railway shippers, but have been thinking, how can we continue to be successful shippers? They might have morphed into Federal Express or something like it. But it took a Fred Smith to write a paper at Yale <clears throat> proposing a brand new way to ship products fast involving hubs. Now, anyone care to hazard a guess what grade Fred Smith got for the paper making this proposal? What? Exactly. A C. How'd you know that? I've known this He's exactly right. A C. And it was almost like a gift C, because the professor told him, to get a higher grade, Mr. Smith, you are going to have to present me with a more plausible idea. More plausible idea. One more likely to succeed. You see, the professor was thinking, he was too caught up in this success mode. How can we succeed? What's most likely to succeed? Smith wasn't thinking about success. He wasn't thinking about failure. He was thinking about, how can we do something brand new? Let's take a chance. Let's see if it works. And it did. I'd love to know what the professor's up to now. A success obsession like his is a, 
a key obstacle to innovation, you know, making this clean division between success and failure and glorifying the former. This is a poster I picked up a few years ago. I just love it. Are you standing at the fork in the road? I mean, check it out. Failure. Oh, terrible. Rats. <laughs> you see that? There's a skull. Lightning. A graveyard. It's all dark. Ew. No one wants that. But hey, look at success. The, gold, the yellow brick rolled. It's all green, money. It's all light, sunlight. Success, wonderful. I think it's a cult of success that gets us in trouble when it comes to innovation. And boy, is there a cult of success in this country. I get a newsletter at home, the success newsletter. I didn't request it, it came in. There's the oh, success magazine. You know, you, I'm sure you've seen success magazine. And oh, my home. Local newspaper has a success seminar, full page, discounted prices. <laughs> uh, and then there's books, how to make a habit of success. You know, there's that rainbow again. And then who can forget dress for success? Now, about the time that Dress for Success was on the market, there was another book out called Success, exclamation mark, written by Michael Corda. And the whole concept here was how to create an aura of success for yourself, how to look like a success. And the more you looked like a success, the idea was the more successful you were likely to be. Now, here's an illustration that was in the book. You know, check it out. Now here's the successful handker you know, handkerchief in the pocket. There's the unsuccess, I don't know, he's got it folded wrong. Now let's look a little closer at the loser, <laughs> the loser's jacket pocket. The geek look, right? Pen protector. Too many pens, markers, ew. Geek, loser. Now, about the same time that Michael Corda's book was out, with all these advisories, another group was hard at work. Maybe you've seen this on the internet. Would you have invested? There's Paul Allen in the bottom right corner. And of course, there's Bill Gates looking a little younger in the lower left corner, number one. The second, I don't know, one of the richest men in the world and the richest. Is Bill Gates still the richest man in the world? Yeah, richest man in the world. You think they were reading Michael Corda? <laughs> you think they were reading Dress for Success? <laughs> I don't think so. And yet they went on to create one of the most successful corporations in the history of the world. But that successful corporation is full of failures. Pen-based computing, they never got it together on search engines. They tried to do an HTML substitute called Blackbird. And does anyone remember Bob, the user-friendly interface? They're full of failures. They don't talk about them. But as a colleague once said of Gates, and it has come up many times today, Gates knows that the secret to innovation is to fail fast. Steve Jobs apparently knows that too. I once heard a product developer at Apple discuss how his boss had come to him one day and said, Levy, you're screwing up. I want you to get in shape. You got to do a better job. David Levy. And Levy said, well, okay, what am I doing wrong? What do I have to do? His boss said, you're not failing enough. We're not getting enough failure out of you. We want an 80% mistake rate in the products you develop. And that's the only way we'll know that you're in fresh territory. Well, you know, on the one hand, that attitude sounds absurd. 
On the other hand, that attitude led to the iPod, but it also led to the Apple Newton. Anybody remember the Newton? You know, that pen-based handheld computer that was a total fiasco. You can't have it both ways. Terrible failures, great successes. Whoever makes the most mistakes wins. That's not my slogan, wish it were. It came from this gentleman. Anybody know? This? John Wooden, one of my heroes. And Wooden is the guy who said, whoever makes the most mistakes wins. What did he mean by that? He said, well, the doer makes mistakes. Mistakes come from doing, but so does success. Many innovations, many great innovations, have been the product of mistakes, literally the product of mistakes. Procter Gamble folks here? Procter Gamble? Ivory soap, late in the 19th century. A guy left a batch of soap whipping while he went out to lunch, forgot it was on, came back, it was all frothy and filled with air. He let it dry out and put it in the water, and it floated. Dang, floated. You know, so the immediate reaction was, that's terrible. We've got to throw it out now and start all over. Luckily, he was headed off, and somebody else said, wait. Well, the person who said wait had the right idea because it floats became one of the great selling points in American consumer history for ivory soap. Microwave oven you know, was a result of a guy at Raytheon right after World War II with a chocolate bar in his pocket, getting too close to a magnetron. A few minutes later, realizing that his pocket was full of goo. Dang, got to wash those pants now. But wait, what made that thing melt? Then he remembered being near the magnetron. You know, began to think, what is it inside that magnetron? Could it be the micro, anyway. The microwave oven resulted. Highlighters. A French scientist in 1962 accidentally spilled some ink on a piece of text he was reading. And he went, ah, oh, mon dieu. <laughs> he probably said merde, but anyway, mon dieu. But then he looked down and he realized he could read the text through the ink. And then he went, voila. And the result was highlighters result of an accident, a mistake. And then there's post-it notes. As I'm sure many, most of you probably know, was the result of a failed experiment to find a stronger adhesive at 3M that resulted in a weaker adhesive. But there's a culture at 3M which says don't hide your mistakes. Who knows what might come of it? You will not be penalized for your mistakes. Talk about them, bring them up, and they do. And the gentleman who failed with the, this adhesive, which was too weak, mentioned it to other people at 3M. And a few years later, a gentleman named Art Silver, when he was having trouble putting bookmarks in a hymnal, wonder, got thinking about this glue. I wonder if it, was re, if it could be re-adhered. And of course it could. And post-it notes resulted, and it's one of the great products of modern times, one of those how do we ever live without it products. Now 3M is kind of a, a citadel of products discovered by accident. One woman chemist once accidentally spilled some fluorochemicals on her boots, her sneakers actually, and then it dried out. She was, you know, couldn't figure out how she was ever going to get it out. But she went out, it was raining, she walked a little bit, she looked down and the water was beating up. Scotch guard. And then <clears throat> there was a failed brassiere <laughs> that became a successful surgical mask. That's how they do it at 3M. They're on the lookout for mistakes. They don't penalize mistakes. They don't view mistakes as a mistake.
you know, they're a little embarrassed, I think, that so many of their products were a result of accidents, but that's beside the point. Accidents, mistakes happen every day in every organization. Most of the time, they're covered up. At 3M, they're almost lionized. A CEO at 3M named William McKnight a few decades ago said, mistakes will be made, but if a person is essentially right, the mistakes he or she makes is not as serious in the long run as the mistakes management will make if it's dictatorial and undertakes to tell those under its authority exactly how they must do their job. So, mistakes have value. So they can have basic value. Evolution is a product of mistakes. You know, evolution occurs when mutations happen, mistakes in the design of an organism, and over time the mistakes, the mutations that are, that are contribute to survival help those, those organisms survive. The worst thing that can happen to a species, evolutionarily speaking, is that they enjoy too much success in too narrow a niche and never make the changes that they need to make in order to survive in a much broader universe. I think that's an analog to business. In other words, I think businesses that don't make enough mistakes adapt poorly to changing conditions. Now, we've heard a lot today about, you know, you got to be open to making mistakes, you got to take chances, failure is good within reason, all of which I believe. I've looked into it, and there's actually a long history of thinking along this line, like centuries of, of maxims and aphorisms, like not failure but low aim is crime, or he who never made a mistake never made anything. My favorite is those who don't make mistakes work for those who do. So I think you know, in a way, I'm preaching to the converted here in that regard. But I think in a sense, we, yeah, we all know we have to risk failure. We all know that mistakes will be a product of taking chances. But what makes it so hard, nonetheless, to do that? Well, let's think about that. Let's look a little bit more closely at the, the psychology of taking risks that might fail. Or we might blow it. Screw up big time. Lose standing with our peers. Lose face. Lose money. Lose competitive advantage. But face is the worst. Face is the biggie. Losing face is where the rubber hits the road when it comes to the inhibitions we all feel about taking risks. When I was studying risk-taking, one of the people I talked to was a, a stand-up comedian who had uh, previously been a, a prize fighter, a professional boxer. And I said to him, which is harder to do? Which do you see as more dangerous, boxing in the ring or telling jokes up on stage? He said, oh, telling jokes on stage, far more dangerous, no comparison. I said, but you could die in the boxing ring. He says, you can die up on stage. <laughs> he says, I've seen it happen many a time. I said, yeah, but you get up in the morning. He said, yeah, except you don't want to. And that was interesting to me and not uncharacteristic. I find particularly among men that the risk of losing body, the risk of physical harm, is much less scary than the risk of losing face. Now, let me ask you a question. And this is a question I asked many people when I did my study on risk taking. Imagine yourself going up to the top of a very high dive. There's a long line of people behind you. Your turn finally comes. You walk out to the edge of the dive. 
you look down and you think you might get seriously hurt if you go off that dive. You look over your shoulder, long line of people still there. What do you do? What do you do? Well, do you dive anyway? Do you jump in feet first? Do you turn around and walk back down? Well, most of the people I asked this question told me that they would either dive or jump. A minority said they would turn around and walk back down. But there was a very interesting division between men and women. The vast, vast majority of men said they would dive or jump. Very few men said they would turn around and walk back down. Quite a few women did. <coughs> Which is the bigger risk? Dignity is the mortal enemy of discovery. Beth had in her presentation this morning, and I want to repeat, if, there's no, if your idea is not absurd, there is no hope for it. This man said that. But to propose an absurd idea, you've got to be willing to look absurd. You know, like this guy. Do you get the impression that dignity was not uppermost in Einstein's mind? And yet he's one of the great creative geniuses of all time. I think the two are connected. I think Einstein was free to be creative because he didn't give two hoots about how he looked how he was coming across, how dignified he was. To propose ide absurd ideas as Einstein did often, and bear in mind the theory of relativity was considered utterly absurd in its time, you have to be willing to look absurd. Be laughed at, ridiculed. Maybe for wearing fuzzy slippers. Absurd ideas invite ridicule. That's why they're so seldom proposed. Alan Vandemore, an engineer at Kodak, about two, just over two decades ago, came up with an idea for a single-use camera that would then be thrown away, disposable camera. Well, he, he said he was literally, people literally laughed in his face. Alan. You know, we do cameras here, you know, cameras. You take film, you put film in the camera, you close it up, you take pictures, you open it back up, you take the film out, you put more film in. We do not throw our cameras away. And they laughed and they laughed, but he was one of these people, these delusional people we were talking about earlier, who kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing, and eventually they gave it a try with the fling. And that led to other disposable cameras that became Kodak's major profit center in the waning days of film photography. Will Rogers once said, the popular guy is the guy who sees one week ahead, because that's as far as the crowd sees. He said, if you're seeing months or years ahead, you need a telescope. And a telescope does not make you popular. Mark Andreessen said, I think, one of the most perceptive things on this topic of, of being willing to risk ridicule to be innovative. Andreessen, incidentally, is the founder of Netscape. And Mr. Andreessen said, if your idea is not being laughed at, forget about it. It's stale. Twenty people are already working on that idea someplace else. If your idea is sensible, other people are already, are, are already, have already had that idea. But if your idea is ridiculous, then there's a chance for it, as Einstein said, except you'll be laughed at. So to Andreessen, the gauge of the freshness of an idea was how hard the laughter was when that idea was proposed. 
So, just think a second. Imagine, anybody remember the princess phone? Okay, imagine 30 years ago. Let's, you know, let's just take a little imaginary trip. 30 years ago, back to Bell Labs, and a supervisor in the research lab calls one of his research engineers in. He says, Jack, you know, we need to be thinking ahead, you know, really ahead, really far down the road, come up with some new ideas that'll, you know, keep us from getting too stale. You got any new ideas for us? Jack takes the phone. He says, well, maybe we could get some tunes out of this phone. You know what I'm saying? Make it so people could listen to music. <laughs> Come on, Jack, says his supervisor. This is a communication device. Two way, not one way. That's ridiculous. You got any other ideas? And Jack says, well, how about this? What if you could take pictures with your phone? You know, hold it up, click a button, take a picture. <laughs> Come on, Jack. Now you're getting crazy. Jack, this is a telephone. You know, you listen, you talk. You listen, you talk. You do not take pictures with a telephone. You take pictures with a camera. Get out of here. Come back when you have a good idea. So I think one way to identify the freshness of your idea is not just that it be ridiculed, but that you be afraid it might get ridiculed. And fear in this sense is a good sign. Not a bad sign, good sign. The flushed cheeks, you know, trembling fingers. Something hard. One of my best book ideas came from going down to my mailbox, opening up the mailbox, pulling out a letter, reading in the left-hand corner, CHS, class of 62. Anyone care to guess what was inside? Huh? Reunion. So I opened it up, pulled out the paper. You are invited to the CHS class of 62 senior class reunion. Well, all of a sudden, the paper started rattling. Why was the paper rattling? Well, it wasn't the paper rattling, it was my fingers trembling. You know, you think a reunion is just a casual, you know, hey, what's the big deal? You go back, you have a few drinks, a few laughs, you remember old times. Uh-uh. That's when hairdressers do most of their business. <laughs> That's when curves really enrolls them. And my thought wasn't, you know, go back and have a few laughs. My thought was, do I really want to go back there and let those guys have another shot at me? <laughs> nah. That was why that paper was rattling. But out of that rattling paper came this idea. Wow, if I am so shook, if I am so shook up by this crazy little reunion announcement, I wonder if other people are having a similar reaction. And I wonder if there might be a book in it. Well, there was. It's something I never would have thought about as a possible book idea if I hadn't had those trembling fingers holding my reunion announcement. So I think when you're feeling afraid, it can be a sign that you're going to new places. When it comes to innovation, to turn FDR around, the only thing to fear is lack of fear itself. You know, if you're not afraid, you're not taking a chance. That's why your innovation requires such courage, because we know we're going to be scared when we go to these new places, not knowing what will happen to us. You know, we have this stereotype of the fearless risk taker, the mountain climber, the skydiver, the hang glider. I've spent a lot of time with these folks in, my, in the course of my years of research on risk taking. 
they are all scared to death. They are, and they're the first to admit it. In fact, many of them say, the reason I do these things is to challenge my fear, to get beyond my fear. To put it another way, they're afraid, but they're not afraid of their own fear. They're going into their fear. I once heard Sue Grafton, the, the mystery novelist, say, every day I sit at my desk, I am scared to death. And I once heard Ted Turner, in the, when he was first founding Cable News Network, an interviewer said to him, well, Mr. Turner, aren't you scared? And Turner, God love him, said, I have been scared every day of my life. <laughs> Being afraid isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, when Marsha first invited me to come here and speak, she said, and Ralph, guess what? We're going to have a theater in the realm. 360 degrees. And I took a deep breath and said, wow, that's 180 degrees more than I'm used to. <laughs> and, you know, something hard. Flushed cheeks, trembling. Anyway, you know. My, my, my first thought was, hmm, I wonder how I can get out of this. <laughs> Is it too late? But my second thought was, oh, 360 degrees. God, that scares the heck out of me. I didn't say heck, but anyway. I, that scares the heck out of me, but it might be interesting. It might be a challenge. And then the more I thought about it, the more I began to get excited. You know, something different, something new, something almost daredevilish. I like the idea. Now, excitement, I think we tend to forget excitement is the flip side of fear. Kids know that. You know, remember when you were five? Throw me up again, Daddy. Throw me up again. You know, real high this time. Scare me, Daddy. Scare me. You know, we loved to be scared when we were five. It was so much fun. But, you know, we get older. Now it's 2005, there's terrorists, there's criminals, there's tornadoes, there's hurricanes, there's payrolls to meet, there's changing business conditions. Isn't life scary enough? So we do what we can to, to hold down our fear, to push aside our fear, to avoid our fear. And yet, if we're going to go in to new places, we have to go into our fear, not away from it. And that's what I mean when I say that fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. Just ask a kid. Now, kids don't play in the same way we do. They don't even know the concept of success. Kids play for the excitement, for the fun. That's why they're so creative. I love some of the examples we've seen today. They just do what they're doing because they want to do it. They don't, you know, win, lose, succeed, fail. You remember the 2000 whatever Olympics, Winter Olympics? Remember Michelle Kwan? Michelle Kwan went for the gold. She was very, very success oriented. And didn't get there. She was stiff, she was inhibited. Sarah Hughes, just skated, just skated with abandon. She didn't think she had a chance. She went out and had fun like a kid. And the paradox seems to be that the less we pursue success, the more likely we are to succeed. That's the mantra of John Wooden, of Phil Jackson, the two premier basketball coaches of modern times. Don't try to succeed, prepare, focus. Jackson talks constantly of mindfulness, of just being so engaged in what you are doing that you will succeed even though you're not pursuing that goal. In our book, we call that the samurai method, the samurai method of success because the samurai said exactly the same thing, that, that whoever, when he pulls, pulls the arrow and the bow, is focused on hitting the target will miss the target. Whoever pulls the arrow and the bow and focuses simply on pulling it as hard and as straight as possible will hit the target. 
Now, it's often said, you know, there just aren't enough risk takers around, particularly where I work. <clears throat> you know, a lot of weenies. You know what I'm saying? They wouldn't know a risk if they couldn't take a chance if their life depended on it. Well, let's look at that. Have any of you ever taken a toaster that was plugged in, had a piece of stuck bread, and dug around in that toaster to get the stuck bread out? Well, over half the people I asked in my poll on risk-taking said, yeah, I've done that. Here's some other things I asked about. 88% jaywalk. 79% leave home on a dark and cloudy day without an umbrella or a raincoat. 69% drive cars whose gas gauge <laughs> registers empty. 29% put off paying bills until dunning notices begin to arrive. 24% turn on electric appliances while taking a bath or a shower. Now that is dangerous. <clears throat> One of the people I interviewed in, during my project was Philippe Petit. Does that name mean anything? To, um, okay, Philippe Petit is a wire walker. And he's the guy who several years ago strung a cable between the two towers of the World Trade Center when there were two towers and spent an hour walking half a mile between the towers, a mile above the ground, no net. And when I met Petit, I asked him, how did you get to be such a risk taker? And Petit bristled, he's a bristly kind of guy, and he said, excuse me, I'm not a risk taker. I said, excuse me, what do you call walking on a cable a mile above the concrete of Manhattan without a net? He said, that was not a risk. He said, I spent a year preparing that walk. I took care of every contingency. And I said, OK, OK, let's say that wasn't a risk. What would be a risk to you? And Petit thought, and then he said, well, like touching spiders. <laughs> or getting close to snakes. Ooh, I hate snakes. Or jumping into water. I don't like water very well. And I said, oh, OK. Well, then let me, tell me this. What is the biggest risk you could imagine taking? And Petit said, you mean like getting married? <laughs> or having kids? We're all risk takers. We're all safety seekers. It just depends on the context. It depends on who we are. It depends on where we work. It depends on what's going on. You know, I sometimes ask managers, how do you try to get your employees to take more chances? Usually they say, well, we tell them to take more chances. You know, take more chances. <laughs> well, I once asked a middle manager about that. He said, well, you know, at work, they're always telling us, take more risks. But you're never expected to fail. He said, so of course nobody takes any risks, including me. They watch what's done, not what's said. And if failure is penalized, if mistakes are sanctioned, at best the, game, the people who game the system learn how to take insignificant little risks that look, you know, might succeed, but are, don't amount to anything. Punishing failure, Jack Welch said, assures that no one dares. So how do you get across that it's OK to take chances, make mistakes, fail? One way is to admit your own. I just heard Kemmons Wilson recently, I not heard, I read about Kemmons Wilson, the founder of Holiday Inn, talking about how <laughs> He had advised Sam Phillips, the record producer, to sell Elvis Presley's contract for $35,000. And Wilson loved to tell this on himself. A CEO at 3M liked to talk about Thinsulate and how he had tried for years to head it off in the same way that we heard about the, the guy at HP do, uh, doing the same thing, Packard. But he told it on himself. 
Guizueta loved to talk about how he had backed new Coke and how he had once got a letter from an outraged Coke drinker that was addressed, Dear Chairman Dodo. <laughs> but the point was, they told it. They told it on themselves. And I think the idea they were putting across by doing that was, it's OK. You know, it's OK. I make mistakes. You can make mistakes. And the message is, hey, if my boss can make mistakes, maybe I can too. Create awards, best mistake of the month, ask for crazy ideas, no penalty. One guy in a situation like that came up with a, a great idea that was implemented. And he was one of these people who had been in the woodworks for years at work. And when he was asked, how come you never had an idea like that before? He said, nobody ever asked me. Bring in stand-ups. Bring in on your feet. I'd love to have a, a stand, see a stand-up workshop at work. You know, how do you deal with that risk of looking foolish? How do you handle it? How can you help us learn to handle that risk? Most of all, treat success and failure more similarly like the two imposters that Kipling said they are. Both are a result of bold action. And when we punish one and reward the other, that's when we, I think, head off possible innovations. Instead, reward passion, engagement, daring. I don't know any better way to create the kind of innovative, bold, creative environment that we're here to talk about today, and that is the only way that I know of to have the fresh, visionary environment that we all need to stay afloat in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much.